From the world headquarters of Archer Daniels Midland in Decatur, Illinois, I'm Bob Messenger. And I'm Robert Baldwin. Welcome to another edition of Food and Beverage America. On the menu today. I don't think of it as politics. Really, it's governmental economics. The world according to Dwayne Andreas. Listen, Russia right now is anarchy. And the future of ADM. Our technology is going to be a miracle in China. Plus, a room with a view. Much of the future is going to be predictable for some companies. And a man with a vision. Right price, right place, right product. We'll take a look at what's in store for the food and beverage industry as we do a little future shopping at the supermarket to the world. We're in ADM's gateway to the world, and it's here in this trading room that ADM manages the ebb and flow of the world's commodity markets. Bob, when you look at the magnitude and impact of ADM, it's hard to imagine that a company that literally feeds the world grew out of a soybean and a corn kernel. It's like a modern-day version of the parable about the loaves and the fishes. Take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and miraculously turn it into enough food to feed a hungry multitude. As incredible as it sounds, that's just what Archer Daniels Midland has done, simply by exploring the limitless applications for American grain. So we, we like to think we get out everything out of the bushel but the squeal. And in the process of processing food ingredients from corn, soybean, and wheat, ADM has become one of the great success stories of the 20th century and one of the keys to feeding an overcrowded world in the new millennium. So you see, it's easy to be proud of the fact that in addition to making money, you are accomplishing something in the world. Over the course of 100 years, ADM has grown into a multinational giant known as the supermarket to the world, developing a global network of processing plants, research labs, and transportation systems. We have 2,500 barges. We have 25,000 rail cars working for us. We have 50,000 trucks on the highways at any given moment. We have 100 ships on the high seas. We have 165 factories. We have 300 depots serving these factories, all working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as though they were one unit. As if by providence, ADM has always seemed to be in the right place at the right time, with the right solutions to some tough problems. To answer the world's food shortages, ADM came up with dehydrated soy protein that feeds many of the poorer nations. In response to the Arab oil embargo of the 80s and a personal plea from President Reagan, ADM took its corn and made ethanol, the revolutionary gasoline additive that has dramatically cut fuel consumption and carbon monoxide pollution. It was ADM that provided low-fat, low-cholesterol oils to a health-conscious America looking for an alternative to butter and animal fats. And it was ADM that replaced sugar with fructose in soft drinks and countless other products on the market. Yet despite these remarkable accomplishments, ADM believes its greatest challenges are just now presenting themselves. I have never seen a time where there is more opportunity for growth in the agri-processing business uh, than today. ADM Senior Vice President Martin Andreas sees the company's future linked to projections that the world's population will more than double from 5 to 11 billion people within the next 50 years. For 30 years, you and I heard about a population explosion. It was coming, it was coming. And we all got to be skeptics because it never came. But I would suggest now it has arrived. In anticipation of the day when land available to grow crops and raise livestock will be unable to meet the demands of an exploding population, ADM is working overtime researching and developing ways to head off the crisis. ADM is already achieving great success with a variety of soybean-based products that are proving to be a delicious, protein-rich alternative to meat. They include links, burgers, and a ground meat taste alike all being sold by Green Giant in most markets around the country. And there are other similar products in development specifically for export, like meals in a bag. 
and it's a combination of textured soy protein and a carbohydrate source. It can be rice or it can be pasta as an example. And the textured soy protein can be made to look like and taste like beef, pork, or chicken. So we're very bullish that this product is going to have an opportunity for feeding the masses around the world. ADM Vice President Larry Cunningham oversees the company's long line of value-added products, which also includes a combination of soy protein and beef that drastically reduces fat content and extends meat supply. And uh, we have been successful in doing the same thing with hams, with barbecues, with sausage products, with wieners as well by combining the uh, pork with, uh, with our soy proteins. Then there's soy milk. This product has a shelf life of a year. And like the meal in the bag, all you have to do is to add water to this product um, and it's, it's ready for consumption. It has no lactose in it and it has no cholesterol in it. So it's a healthy alternative. ADM is also moving ahead rapidly and successfully with a fish farming program or aquaculture to help solve a worldwide seafood shortage. And so we think aquaculture is going to play an increasing role in that. In fact, about 15% of the seafood production in the world last year came from aquaculture. Intensive research led ADM to concentrate on a variety of Mediterranean fish called tilapia, which grows 60% faster than any other fish in the world. It's the most efficient animal that we know of on the face of the earth. And that is, it only takes 1.8 pounds of feed to get one pound of fish. I defy you to find any animal on the face of earth that will gain weight as well as this fish. ADM is also experimenting with hydroponic farming. And the company has even found a way to mine its crops to produce an extensive variety of bioproducts like vitamin C and E, as well as the vital amino acid lysine. We have uh, built a business here where we put about a billion and a half dollars into uh, bioproducts, and one of the main ones is lysine. And lysine is basically a uh, it goes into feed formulas. It's an additive. It's an amino acid. And you say, well, wh what good is it? Well, what good it is is that it adds weight onto the body quicker and mass onto the body of the chicken or the hog. They mature quicker. They cycle through quicker. It's that simple. And that, along with ADM's other innovations, means more food for a lot more people. But even ADM's illustrious chairman concedes the company would have to grow many times over very quickly to meet the needs of the world in the 21st century. You would have to have five more ADMs to make the lysine that will be needed in 10 years. You would have to have five more ADMs to make the corn products that will be needed in 10 years. You will have to have three more companies like ADM, although they were the largest in the world in oil seeds, to make uh, the uh, soybean meal that will need it be needed in 10 years, and you will need five ADMs to make the cooking oil that will be needed, and you will need, get this, 15 ADMs to make the bread that will be needed in the world 10 years from now. Robert, behind every great company, there's a great man. And in the case of ADM, it's Dwayne Andreas, an American visionary who has led ADM to where it is today and is still guiding this industry giant as it seizes the challenges of tomorrow. If you're going to be in this kind of business, you must know that you are doing what the government wants you to do. Maybe they're wrong, but you can't oppose a government. When we come back, the world according to Dwayne Andreas. One of the newest developments in nutrition is actually one of the oldest foods known to man, the soybean. For over 4,000 years, the Chinese have used it to make nutritious, protein-rich foods. But in America, the history of the soybean is considerably shorter. In fact, it didn't become a widely used food ingredient here until the 50s. One thing's for sure, though, it's come a long way since then. 
Over the years, one company has led the way in unlocking the versatility of the soybean. A company that each day continues to develop new ways to use this abundant, functional source of protein. The Archer Daniels Midland Company. That's using the old bean. Welcome back to ADM's World Headquarters in Decatur, Illinois. The man who sits at the top of this great multinational is more than your traditional chairman and CEO. Dwayne Andreas is an American icon whose business expertise has had a profound impact on the world and made him a friend and confidant to world leaders from Eisenhower and Nixon to Reagan and Gorbachev. He has a unique insight into the workings of business. And now in a rare and remarkable interview, he shares his vision of the future with Bob Messenger. A lot of folks, when they talk about you, say that you are as politically astute as you are about the food industry itself. Politics is important today in, in being a major player on the world stage, or at least understanding politics. I don't think of it as politics. Really, it's governmental economics. Most governments are socialist now, semi-socialist. All the European governments are democratic socialist governments run by conservative people, but they're managing things. Even our country is more democratic socialist than we admit to because the government's involved in our businesses. If you're going to be in this kind of business, you must know that you are doing what the government wants you to do. Maybe they're wrong, but you can't oppose a government. You need to be close enough to understand which direction they're going, what they will approve of. And if you're going to invest money, that you're going to have a tailwind and not a headwind economically. Let's talk about something that I think is near and dear to your heart, and that's NAFTA and GATT. Now, you see the complaints about NAFTA. We knew those complaints would occur. In fact, uh, I think we discussed that with the president. There is a certain time here when some jobs will move toward Mexico. Uh, it won't be all uh, peaches and cream. But over a 10 or 15 year period, NAFTA will be a great thing for this country and a great thing for Mexico. First you have to have enough free trade so that, let's just think about Mexico, the standard of living in Mexico must double. If the standard of living of Mexico doubles, gets up just to the level that it is in, uh, in the, say, in the Caribbean, they would use 50 to 75 billion dollars more American food, upgraded food like meat and chicken. So the key to prosperity for us is to get the standard of living of the Mexican people up. NAFTA will do that. The same thing is true of GATT. I love your optimism about Mexico. You're, you're enthusiastic. And I, I'm not hearing that from a lot of people in the food industry today because it's so volatile down there. They talk about corruption and you name it. It's just a place everybody's afraid of. You are optimistic and you sound like you're saying, let's go. This is the time to get into Mexico because things are very cheap there. You go in there with American dollars, you can buy things. Uh, not really cheap, but I mean, they're worth the money. Pay no premium. Uh, you can build things there. You have good labor. Mexicans are very good workers. Labor is cheap. Uh, this is the time to go in there. A lot of companies have had trouble, a lot of major players and even some multinationals trying to perform successfully in third world markets. ADM seems to have found a way to do that successfully. Why you and, the, and, and why do the others have so much trouble? We've had a good deal of experience making mistakes <laughs> in third world markets. So uh, what we have done in recent years is we have learned that you must have local partners. Like in China, we do a very, very good business, but we have local people as our partners. In some cases, we only own 20% of the business because we need to have them. In, 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 in one case, we have a government corporation as our partner. And that works. But we have found the hard way that to send Americans into third world countries to run and do a business doesn't work very well. You must make a good economic partnership with the local people. One of the scarier markets for companies to compete in is Russia. It's very volatile today, um, and yet you guys have dived headfirst in there. And you've, In fact, you've been in there a long time. Russia right now is anarchy, and it's in a great depression. 
But, of course, eventually it will be a huge market. When Russia starts improving again, when free enterprise takes hold, Russia will be a huge market again. That's one of the, the interesting things about, about companies sometimes. They, they think business is business. And you're talking to a guy like, like Castro, but yet somebody back here might say, well, why is Dwayne Andrews talking to Castro? He's, he's the bad guy. I'm only talking to him about business now. He needs a big oil refinery there to get cooking oil for his people. He needs a big sugar refinery to, to upgrade his sugar value added to make more money in the world market out of his sugar. We can do both of those things for him. That's what he'd like to have us do. Of course, we're prohibited from doing it. The laws that were once put up against Castro really are just laws against people like me now. The U.S. confines its own people, while the British, the French, the Spanish, everybody else can go in there except us. But uh, I think you'll see a growth rate in Cuba of maybe 3, 3.5% three over the next few years, and they'll begin, the standard of living will begin to rise. Let's take a look at tomorrow and down the road a few years, maybe the next century. Where are the opportunities for your company? I think that we need to become very rapidly more global. We have about as big a percentage of the business in the United States that we're in as, as you should have. I mean, after you get 20% of a certain field, you're competing with yourself. If you get 30%, you may have too much. There's, there's a certain limit. People don't like to buy everything from one company. So our future growth has got to be in places like China and, of course, Europe. China is where the big future is. There are a billion people there, and their standard of living is rising at a fantastic rate. And our business in China will grow probably 25% every single year. Our technology is going to be a miracle in China. It will get more food into millions of people's mouths that they like, that they're already trained to eat soy products. I think that's where ADM will make its biggest move in coming years. Don't go away. We have a lot more coming up. Food Processing Magazine is your ticket to the industry's leading decision makers. From R&D, packaging and equipment to business and marketing, Food Processing touches all key segments of the food and beverage industry. Food Processing and its 80,000 readers are the supplier's magazine of choice to carry their marketing messages to the people with the power to influence business decisions. If you want your advertising to count, count on Food Processing Magazine. For more information on advertising rates or the editorial calendar, just call 312-644-2030. Hi, I'm Robert Baldwin along with Bob Messenger with news and views on trends and other insights impacting the food and beverage markets. Well, Bob, Procter & Gamble is finally in the game now that Olestra has been approved by the FDA. Yeah, but you can take this to the bank, Robert. Olestra, under the brand name Olean, will be slammed, slandered, and slapped around by the likes of Michael Jacobson of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, perhaps Olestra's greatest enemy. Jacobson's already on the record saying Olestra causes everything from diarrhea to cancer, heart disease, and blindness. That's pretty strong criticism. And pretty wrong, considering Jacobson has yet to prove any of those silly accusations. In any event, Olestra's here and some companies like Frito-Lay are already testing product made with the fat replacer. So, what's the latest word on pasta? Well, pasta's healthy image drove it to new consumption and sales highs in 1995. Find SVP, the New York-based research firm, says the retail market for pasta in this country reached nearly $2 billion, and that's up from 1991's $1.6 billion. And by the year 2000, Robert, the retail market and the value-added pasta segment will combine to make pasta a $5 billion business. Consumers and their desire for more healthy and nutritious eating will keep pasta riding high well into the next century. Of course, all this healthy eating doesn't explain the fact that America is getting fatter all the time. 
Or maybe it's all the sauce they're putting on the pasta. No, Robert. For, if they're like me, first they eat the pasta, then they eat the cheesecake. <laughs> General Mills says it has completed the selection of 75 real women who will form the composite of the new Betty Crocker, which an artist has already used to form a computer-generated composite image of a more contemporary Betty. Uh-huh. But I'll tell you this, based on that composite, she's a real goody two-shoes. She can cook, teach Sunday school, serve as a PTA leader, own her own business, she's socially responsible, and on and on. The way I see it, Robert, anyone with that kind of image is probably dying to cut loose and party down. So yeah, I'd go out with her. A first-of-its-kind campaign to identify certified organic foods went into effect recently in Minneapolis area supermarkets sponsored by the Midwest Organic Alliance. Bright new organic food label with a yellow sun rising in a blue sky over a green field is now in products in over 60 Minneapolis grocers and food co-ops. I like this move, Robert, because I never liked the positioning of organic foods in the first place. This is an industry where glitz and glitter sells, and this should at least be helpful in giving organic foods a stronger presence in the supermarket. Well, that's it for news and views, but stay tuned because we've got a lot more coming up. We do not have an average American anymore. Everybody is different. A futurist view of the industry when Food and Beverage America returns in a moment. There was a party the other day in Dinuba, California. The Ruiz family and all the folks at El Monterey were celebrating the first shipment of their new El Monterey Mexican Grill burritos, enchiladas, and quesadillas. Everyone agreed they're the best tasting frozen Mexican foods ever. But there was still one big hurdle, Grandpa Lewis. Fortunately, he approved. And now El Monterey Mexican Grill is headed your way with love from everyone here in Dinuba, California. He was the man who stood against the so-called barbarians at the gate. And we'll be going to RJR Nabisco to speak with industry legend H. John Grinnis on the next edition of Food and Beverage America. Today, the food and beverage industry is a whole new ball game. In fact, it's more like a crystal ball game. As you already heard from the chairman of ADM himself, you've got to anticipate the future and then try to get there ahead of it. That's right, Bob, but there's a unique think tank that's made it its business to show other food and beverage players how to do just that. From this 40th story window, you can look right across Minneapolis and all the way into the future. This lofty perch is a kind of observatory tower for a group of visionaries who can see a new horizon for the food and beverage industry. Right now we're at a window of opportunity because of the industry initiatives going on, because of the success stories of some of the front leaders, much of the future in the next two to five years is going to be predictable for some companies. And that's where David Donnan and his team of business and economic professionals come in. Donnan is the National Director of Food and Packaged Goods for KPMG Pete Morick. He's what you might call the chief architect of a blueprint for tomorrow, a navigator guiding clients through the industry complexities of the 1990s and into the new realities of the 21st century. What we endeavor to do is to bring to our clients that aspects of the business that they can look at from an overview. They can see the strategies and the issues that the companies are facing. This is really a, a deep cut in the manufacturing supply chain. With 72,000 employees in 136 countries, KPMG is already one of the leading professional service firms in the world. But because of a dramatic shift in the way America is living and eating, KPMG has never been more vital to the food and beverage industry than it is at this pivotal point in time. Right now, in fact, 1996 should be a bellwether year. It's the first year where we will see more food purchased away from home than purchased for the home. More people are eating out either at fast food restaurants, full-scale restaurants, or ordering in the takeaway uh, type of marketplace. So the statistics are actually going to show a, a large portion of the food service market now taking a, a, an almost a, a dominant role in uh, food purchases. To compete against this food service challenge, Donnan and his team tell their clients they must rethink the way they go about supplying customers. I think one of the issues right now is, is getting a lowest total cost delivered. Uh, if you go to a fast food restaurant, you pick up a burger and you have a sale at 99 cents a burger, 
it's very difficult to go home and, and make that from scratch for that low of a cost, particularly if you throw in the convenience factor. How can grocery retailing really be low cost delivery to consumers? How do we get rid of the, the uh, inconsistencies, the inefficiencies, the overlap, the duplication that exists within the channel? And that's where efficient consumer response is working at reinventing the whole industry. You have a KPMG hotlink and you go to food and beverage. KPMG's food and packaged goods consultants focus on streamlining a client's supply chain from concept through manufacturing to delivery to the marketplace. KPMG offers information whether it would be in the form of understanding the risks involved in a company right through to the information on how best to compete, cost profiling, market opportunities, alliance partnerships. Who out there could we align ourselves with to give a better aspect a better presentation to the marketplace. KPMG uses its technology network to learn what the consumer wants, how much and where. Clients can then begin to eliminate unnecessary inventory, bring down cost and increase speed of delivery. Right price, right place, right product all have to be delivered to the consumer at the right time. How that is being achieved projects a fascinating picture of the food and beverage industry in the next century and the new millennium, a vision David Donnan shared with me as we spoke at length about the future. The competition in the future is not going to be company to company, but alliance to alliance. And how those alliances work between ingredients, agribusiness, food processors, wholesale distributors, and retailers is going to be an important part of the competitiveness of the, of the future grocery industry. The dynamics of the industry are changing rapidly. There are going to be increasingly more winners and more losers. Who are they? The key uh, winner is going to be one that, that gets that information base coming together, that links up with their, with their customers, their retailers, or the food service operators providing the right product. The loser is going to be one that is not able to link up that information base, not delivering the product on time, being a high cost provider in that channel. We do not have an average American anymore. Everybody is different. Everybody wants different things. And the other thing about consumers is they're fickle. What I like today, I won't necessarily like tomorrow. So the ability to be able to, to understand the trends, capture the data, and move and change to meet those trends is, is, is going to be fundamental. Tell me about changes in consumer habits and their desires. I think the biggest change that we're going to see occur in the food and packaged goods industry is the changing way that consumers are going to buy their product. I think buying the groceries, cooking from scratch will still be there, but the changing dynamic of the channels, the food service channels, the, the mass merchant channels, the grocery re channels, are going to change the way not only consumers buy food, but how food will be prepared. Before, we used to have food where it would be a series of ingredients that we would put together ourselves in our kitchen. In the future, it may already be prepackaged. We may have uh, speed scratch or other types of foods. How consumers prepare and, and purchase and prepare the food will, will change the industry. Certainly one of the major dynamics is globalization. Where are we heading? Globalization is going to be one of the major driving forces in the food industry. What we're seeing now is the large global companies, the Nestle's, the Unilever's, the Grand Met, being able to leverage economies of scale on a global basis. So when they come up with a new product or a new packaging innovation, not only can they land it in North America, but they can land it in Europe, they can land it in Asia. And they can now spread those high research and development costs over a much, much larger base. How do you see the year 2000, 2010 for the food and beverage industry? What I see in, in 10, 20 years will be a different way consumers will buy, a different way consumers will purchase, and ingredients, products coming from a variety of different locations around the world. We're just seeing the, the, the thin edge of the wedge as far as multi-ethnic types of foods coming into the United States. So I see diversity, I see change, and what I see in, 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 the, in the computer industry with short shelf life and changing dynamics and changing technology, the food industry is going to see as well. If you invent a better mousetrap, people will beat a path to your door. The food industry analogy is if you invent a better one-handed hot meal that can be eaten while driving a car, <laughs> the food industry will beat a path to your door. And now here's Bob Messenger with some more Food for Thought. I'm a guy who loves it when the big fellows in our industry lock horns. War is hell. 
even in the food industry. And right now, Coca-Cola Foods and its Minute Maid orange juice brand have invited Tropicana Dole Beverages into the proverbial OK Corral for an old-fashioned shootout. Hey, Tropicana's been one tough puppy of late, and they've had Minute Maid on its heels. But Coca-Cola Foods recently boasted publicly that a national taste test it conducted says consumers like Minute Maid, premium frozen concentrated orange juice, that's a mouthful, better than Tropicana Pure Premium, not from concentrate chilled orange juice, another mouthful. They also say it's a better value. Man, I know the folks at Tropicana. They're a feisty, competitive bunch, and I expect they'll reload and fire right back at Coca-Cola Foods. Bottom line, my friends at Tropicana say they've been kicking the bejeebies out of Coca-Cola Foods and Minute Maid, which may explain Coca-Cola Foods' in-your-face national taste test strategy as a counterattack. This is going to be fun to watch. Watch out, Budweiser. There's a new Miller flagship beer just itching to nip at your category leading heels, which means Miller has pretty much given up on Miller High Life long the icon for this big time brewer. And why not? Miller High Life is selling at one fourth of its one time peak volume level. The new beer under the Miller brand name is now being marketed in Texas, Florida, and Louisiana, and is positioned as a premium with Budweiser dead in its sights. Of course, it's a long way from startup to the throne, and Miller will have to dig deep into its wallet to wage a battle with powerful Anheuser Busch, which will be highly motivated to keep Bud in the driver's seat. I hear through the grapevine that I'm a dirty word at Keebler these days following my occasional wax at Sellout Parent United Biscuit. What I basically said was United Biscuit didn't do much to stoke Keebler's competitive fires versus giant arch rival Nabisco. And I'm not about to change my mind now. Look, guys. None of this was personal. I just think Keebler deserved a better shake considering how intense the cookies and crackers business is. United Biscuit, in my book, was a penny-pinching, uptight UK conglomerate with no stomach for the kind of warfare that goes on on US turf. The truth may hurt, but there it is. Of course, under its new ownership led by Flowers Industries, Keebler may become a much more dangerous arch rival for Nabisco. Have you heard about Coca-Cola's latest reorganization, which will trash the concept of domestic and international units? Instead, Coke will create six operating units, each one focused on a particular region of the world. Well, for a truly global company, I suppose that makes sense, but I got to say it. I don't remember a time in the last 20 years when so much restructuring was going on inside our industry's big guns, the last two years especially. Please note, at the same time Coke was announcing its big change, Kraft Foods was offering an early out retirement package to about 1,400 administrative employees. And did you know, since Kraft began its restructuring strategy, over six billion in annual revenues has been plucked from the corporate piggy bank by buyers, including the huge bakery business, which went for $865 million last summer. Expect more restructuring in 1996 all across the board. And as we enter 1997, most of the big guns should be at or near their corporate core, and the restructuring boom will finally slow down. But I won't bet you on that. Well, that's it. I'll see you next time. I'm Bob Messenger. And I'm Robert Baldwin. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you on our next edition of Food and Beverage America. If you'd like a subscription to Food and Beverage America, or if you've got a story you'd like us to cover, please call us toll-free at 800-303-7553, or visit our website. Our address is foodandbev.com.